Hello, everyone. This is Jim Hughes with AFIO Now. We are a program of recorded interviews with former U.S. intelligence officers and those who have written about them. Today, I have a very interesting guest. He is an acclaimed uh, author and foreign correspondent. He spent uh, time in many countries overseas, including uh, stints in London, Baghdad, um, Belfast, and Washington, D.C. He's a former uh, Royal Naval officer and now lives in McLean, Virginia. His name is Toby Harden, and he has a brand new book out in September called First Casualty. Toby, welcome to AFIO Now. Hi, Jim. Thanks so much. Good to be with you. Yeah. Toby, what's your new book about? So it's um, the subtitle is The Un Untold Story of the CIA Mission to Avenge 9-11. And at the center of the book is uh, CIA's Team Alpha. So there are eight members, uh, one of them, Mike Spann, former Marine Corps officer and paramilitary, who was killed tragically on November the 25th, 2001. But it's, it's the story of those uh, eight men uh, who were the first behind enemy lines after 9-11, first Americans behind enemy lines. Now, the Jawbreaker team, led by Gary Schroen, um, had gone in on September the 26th, uh, Team Alpha was operating in the mountains south of Masri Sharif uh, in Taliban-controlled te territory, and they arrived on uh, October the 17th. So the chief was J.R. Seeger, former Near East Division case officer. Uh, there were four paramilitaries. Uh, Scott Spellmeyer was, was one of them who rose to uh, senior positions. Uh, David Tyson was the other case officer on the team, uh, an Uzbek. Uh, linguist amongst many other uh, languages he spoke. Uh, he was based in Tashkent at the time, and he was with Mike Spann on the day that, uh, that Mike was killed. So they're, they're, that's the central narrative, really, from 9-11 uh, until uh, December 2001. Uh, but not only the CIA, um, but also the Green Berets, uh, who the, the Team Alpha were the pathfinders for, um, U.S. Air Power, uh, Overhead, which was the you know the key factor in in changing the military equation against the Taliban, um, and also British forces, the Special Boat Service, uh, the equivalent of the Navy SEALs, uh, they were there uh, during the Battle of Kalajangi, which I guess is this six day battle, which began with a prisoner uprising at the fort uh, when Mike was killed. Uh, that's at the that's at the, the core of the narrative. So um, you know it's a it's a it's a book of history, um, but it's it's a very much a character-driven narrative, um, and it's, it, it connects the, the sort of the granular detail of, of that operation. You know, riding on uh, horseback um, sometimes for you know a dozen or more hours across the mountains. You know, no body armor, no helmets. You know, fighting alongside these Uzbek uh, cavalrymen, um, but it connects it with. Certainly the events of 9-11, but also what was happening at headquarters at the time with Kofa Black as the counterterrorism center director, um, uh, briefing Bush and, and, and selling the, uh, along with George Tenet, the director at the time, selling uh, the mission as, as you know, the, the option that the president, President Bush, uh, chose. Hank Crompton, who was uh, brought back from uh, Canberra, where well, he just arrived to be uh, the chief there, um, he became the head of... Uh, counterterrorism center special operations so a, a new kind of unit within ctc and he ran the war day to day uh so it's really the story of you know very successful although you know it's kind of almost ironic looking at what happened you know this year but the very successful mission led by the cia the cia's finest hour is how i think george Tenet has accurately described it uh in just a few weeks um went into the unknown and you know, working with the indigenous allies over through the Taliban regime. Tell me, during the course of your research, what did you learn about how uh, CIA's mission changed after 9-11? It was a complete transformation. Um, I mean, the core of Team Alpha was four paramilitaries, uh, led by Alex Hernandez, um, who rose to SIS rank, as I think did uh, five of, of, of Team Alpha in the end. Um, Scott Spellmeyer was his deputy. Um, it was a guy called Andy, who is still serving in CIA, so we only use his, his first name. And Mike Spann, former Marine Corps officer. So that was the paramilitary team. But there were very few paramilitaries at the time. 
And there had been moves in the agency to to get out of the paramilitary business completely. Um, But all of a sudden, you know, that was what our country needed. Um, But it it wasn't just a paramilitary team. So built built onto that four man team was uh, two case officers that I mentioned. Uh, Mark Rasenberger, who was a physician assistant, former army medic, so he was a team medic. And Captain Justin Sapp, the youngest guy on the team, 29 years old at the time, who was a Green Beret and is still serving uh, as a colonel. And so so it was. this was obviously not, you know, traditional, you know, working the, the circuit in, you know, Vienna and Brussels and London or, you know, even is- Islamabad. This was... Um, you know, a military operation, uh, boots on the ground, and really going back to uh, the OSS days. Um, I know Mark Mitchell, previous guest, who, who's who I interviewed for the book and is featured extensively because he led the mes- the rescue mission uh, into Kalajangi on November the twenty fifth. Um, so it's going back to the OSS roots of of both Central Intelligence Agency and the Green Berets. So it's almost as if everything sort of came full circle. And, and the, you know, the predecessor of the OSS, you know, one of the models of the OSS, Special Operations Executive in World War II. I mean, these, um, this team was, you know, they had Kalashnikovs and, and pistols, no body armor, no helmets. Uh, they were operating deep in enemy territory with, you know, placing their lives in the trust of, of these allies that, you know, they knew very little about. Uh, and so, uh, you know, and it was the start of, um, you know, the CIA, you know, 20 year period um, of the growth of paramilitary operations. Um, I mean, Mike Spann was, uh, is represented by the 79th star on the Memorial Wall um, in the headquarters. And there are now 137 stars. And, you know, we don't know the identities of all of them, obviously, but many, many of them, disproportionate number of work were paramilitaries. And so um, it was a change, big change in mission, um, but in a way going back to the to the beginnings of the, of the CIA as well. How was Mike uh, Spann killed? And what was going on as a backdrop to those sad events? So it's just to sort of look at the timeline. So Team Alpha arrived uh, October the 17th, linked up with Abdul Rashid Dostum, the sort of notorious Uzbek, ethnic Uzbek, Warlord, who at the time was the staunch US ally and, and the Afghan leader that wanted to fight and could have could fight effectively. And so uh, he had a rival, Atta Mohammed Noor, who's a Tajik, uh, a rival, but potential ally. And the first task of Team Alpha was to get those two men literally pointing in the right same direction, which was north towards Masri Sharif. Uh, that involved, you know, cash. I mean, Team Alpha went in with $3 million in non-sequential $100 bills. Um, it involved uh, uh, Atta Mohammed Noor also getting a second CIA team, Team Bravo, which had three members, but Scott Spellmeyer from Alpha went over to command Team Bravo and an ODA. So um, Dostum had ODA 595, which uh, became featured in the book Horse Soldiers in the movie 12 Strong, and Atta had ODA 534. Those forces together with US um, Air Force combat controllers controlling the air, air power overhead, um, they captured Maz- Masri Sharif on November the 10th. It was then um, a sort of relative peace in Masri Sharif, but it was a very sort of ambi- classically Afghan, ambiguous situation. Uh, there was a sense, uh, st- you know, strong sort of belief that uh, the Taliban's last stand would be in Kunduz, uh, around 100 miles to the east of Masri Sharif uh, in late November. And so November 24th, 2001, so the day before the uprising, uh, most of Dostum's forces, most of the Green Berets in, in Mazar and two, two CIA officers from Team Alpha, so, um J.R. Seeger, who was kind of the lead person with Dostum, and Scott Spellmeyer, who was the lead person with Atta, they were heading towards Kunduz. But on that day, uh, 400 Al-Qaeda, and they were Al-Qaeda, not Taliban, they were foreign fighters, no Afghans, um, among them mostly Arabs, but really from every every country, uh, almost, 
well, not every country in the world, but every sort of region of the world, including an American, John Walker Lind. Um, they surrendered. Uh, there was a very kind of murky surrender agreement between the Taliban and Mullah Fazl, who's a notorious a killer in the north, you know, cited by the UN as massacring Hazara Shias, you know, across the north of the country, uh, and Dostum. Um, and JRC had been in the wings, but it was an Afghan surrender. Uh, but it was a surprise. These people, was, the, the Taliban and Al-Qaeda were supposed to be surrendering because they knew they were, they were defeated at this point. They were supposed to be surrendering in Kunduz. In fact, four of them, uh, 400 of them, of, of the Al-Qaeda fighters, uh, arrived in the early hours of uh, November the 24th, 2001, on the eastern edge of Masary Sharif. And there was, there was a whole day of kind of negotiations, uh, trying to work out uh, what was going on. And uh, at the end of the day, as the main U.S. forces uh, headed uh, east to Kunduz, um, these 400 prisoners were put, brought into Kalajangi, which means fort of war, um, Dostum's former headquarters, also used by the Taliban, also used by the Soviets, built in the 1900s. And these 400 were taken to Kalajangi. Uh, as they were uh, being unloaded from the trucks, uh, one of them uh, popped off a grenade, a suicide attack, uh, killed himself and two of Dostum's commanders. Uh, very chaotic situation. And those 400 prisoners were put into the cellar of a building called the Pink House, which was in the southern half of Kalajangi, a Soviet-built sort of schoolhouse uh, building uh, with this fortified cellar. The next morning, uh, David Tyson, the Tashkent-based case officer, and Mike Spann were the two CIA officers who uh, went to the fort to question these prisoners, basically to do a sift uh, and to work out who was, who was in this group. And bear in mind, this was the first time that uh, Americans had had access to Al-Qaeda after 9-11. Uh, there was a very strong sense, and I personally remember it very well, that there was another attack was imminent. Clearly, there was an imperative to find out who was behind 9-11, uh, to stop any future attacks, and to gain intelligence on, on this terrorist group. And so it was... Far from a perfect situation. I mean, no day in Afghanistan for Team Alpha was a perfect situation. This wasn't just another day, but it was it was it was like every other day, fraught with risk. Um, but uh, Mike and David uh, spoke to Hank Crompton, and they agreed that there was a, a need for them to get into the fort and find out who was in this group, because clearly there were some significant people there, and they were all foreign fighters, and so. Uh, around about eight o'clock in the morning on November the 25th, uh, Mike and David arrived. They had a, an Uzbek uh, and Hazara guard force um, uh, left, by, left behind by Dostum and also um, the Northern Alliance intelligence officers, some of whom uh, Team Alpha had worked with closely in the mountains. So they didn't go, in, sometimes depicted as they sort of went in alone. Uh, they didn't have Green Berets with them. They didn't feel they needed them because they had, CIA had been working with the indigenous allies all the way through. Also, the Green Berets, there'd been a directive from Task Force Dagger at the K2 Kashi Khanabad base in Uzbekistan. The Green Berets should not go into the fort that morning uh, because of the suicide attack the night before. And that, that's something that emerged in my research many, many years later. The CIA uh, didn't know about that on, on the morning. Um, but uh, David and Mike went in there. And the prisoners were, and there's video footage of this, incredibly, because Dostum had a videographer there, and the footage survived uh, right up to the moment of the uprising, but not beyond. Uh, the prisoners were brought out in sort of ones and twos uh, and lined up in the southern compound of, of the fort. David, with his many languages, was uh, you know, doing a lot of uh, talking to the, um, to the non-English-speaking prisoners, uh, and, you know, they were, some of them were saying they were for the Mossad, for Mossad, some were saying they were CIA agents, uh, they were just tourists, they were working for Al Jazeera, you know, all sorts of fanciful stories, but also some truth. I mean, some of them, you know, said, yeah, I'm here on jihad, I'm here to kill Americans, 
Uh, I trained at the Alpha Rook and Duranta camps. You know, trained in toxins and, and, and poisons. Uh, so there was, you know, they were getting a lot of information. Uh, my span in particular was focused on uh, prisoners who spoke English. And one of those that he zeroed in on with sort of incredible prescience, I mean, alas, he did not live to find out sort of how right he'd been to focus on this prisoner, but he he hones in on um, this clearly Caucasian male of age 20 who uh, said he was Irish. Um, and in fact, he did have Irish grandparents and his he'd been told by Al-Qaeda to in the al Farouk camp where he trained and where he met bin Laden that he should um, describe himself as Irish and not American. In fact, he was American. His true name was was John Walker Lind. Um, Mike questioned him and David as well uh, extensively. Uh, he did not say a single word, which was very unusual uh, on that day because most of the prisoners, even though many of them were not telling the truth, most of them did, did some uh, speaking. Around about 11 a.m., uh, there was a dozen or 18 or so prisoners still left in the cellar. And uh, all of a sudden, there's the sound of uh, grenades going off, uh, some gunshots. The video, Dawson's video for Fred fled uh, and the, um, the filming stopped. Um, but I you know, interviewed all six surviving members of Team Alpha and spoke many, many hours with David Tyson. And I also interviewed two Afghan doctors who were there on the day and saw Mike Spann's sort of last moments. Uh, but basically, Mike uh, saw the prisoners rushing out of the, of the pink house, uh, used his Kalashnikov to kill a couple of them as they sort of ran towards him. Then he was jumped on from behind uh, by other prisoners who sort of wrestled him to the ground. He used his pistol. Uh, again to kill a couple more, but uh, he was over. He was overwhelmed. Uh, he was able to shout "Dave, Dave, Dave," and David Tyson, who was already experiencing um, classic uh, symptoms of, of sort of combat stress, you know, time slowing down, uh, loss of hearing, uh, tunnel vision. But he did hear those words, and you know, to his immense credit, uh, ran towards Mike killed an Al-Qaeda prisoner who was coming at him with a pistol on the way um, and then used his pistol to kill the four, four guys, four Al-Qaeda guys who were on top of Mike's van. Um, and David, he kicked Mike. He was lying on the ground, kicked him, no response. There's, there's blood on the ground. And the autopsy, uh, which I was able to get a copy of, established that he died from two gunshot wounds to the head. Uh, one of them a contact wound, meaning you know the, uh, the barrel of the the pistol um, was uh, uh, touching his head when it was shot. So sort of execution style, almost certainly in those first moments, uh, and the likelihood it, it was Mike Mike Span's own Glock pistol, which was later recovered. Uh, David is then in this you know almost unbelievable position of. You know, he's he's in the most extreme mortal danger you could imagine. And I would have, you know, put his chances of survival about maybe 5%, 10% at that point. But he just had to sort of kill or be killed. And uh, he chose uh, former. Uh, and so he, he grabbed Mike's Kalashnikov um, and he had his a pistol as well. And he shot and killed his way out. He had grenades bouncing off him didn't explode. Um, it's an incredible uh, escape. Um, there was, uh, you know, one uh, Al-Qaeda fighter who had a guard and had pulled the pin on a grenade and was, you know, gesturing that, that if David shot him, uh, he would blow himself up and the prisoner and David. Uh, so David sort of passed, passed by that guy, but uh, one of the Afghan intelligence officers uh, then shot shot that Al-Qaeda man. And, and then David eventually, you know, say eventually, I mean, I think it, it was like a lifetime for him, but it was about 11 minutes, arrives at the northern end of the fort, uh, relative safety, um, very relative, and spent sort of five hours, uh, there was a German television crew in there, various Afghans, 
uh, five hours at uh, the northern end of the fort, uh, raising the alarm. He called his wife in Tashkent, he called the uh, U.S. Embassy and station in Tashkent. Um, and that's where Mark Mitchell came in and this 15-man rescue force, with, including eight SBS, one of whom was a SEAL, Navy SEAL, called Steph Bass, um, and uh, Glenn, who was a CIA medic from Team Bravo, uh, they uh, drove to the fort, again, not knowing what they were going to face. Um, and, uh, you know, fought uh, tenaciously with Al-Qaeda for the, for, the, for the rest of that day. Uh, David eventually managed to get out and commandeer a vehicle and, and get back to the Turkish school, which was the U.S. base in Nazimi Sharif. And then there was there was five days of of, of fighting in the fort to um, to quell that uprising. So, I mean, it's obviously I could go on and on, and I do in the book, um, but it's it's quite a story. And it, again, it is the sort of last point in this to to link this to the bigger picture. This wasn't some kind of spontaneous uprising. It, uh, many of the Al Qaeda prisoners had not surrendered their weapons partly because it was an Afghan tradition of trust and surrender, um, partly because uh, the Northern Alliance guards, I think, were terrified of these, particularly the Arab fighters. So they kept grenades, rifles, pistols, all sorts of RPGs even, all sorts of stuff with them, and they'd taken it into the, into the pink house and they'd waited for their moment. And there were also Al-Qaeda move and Taliban movements uh, north of Kunduz, and northwest of Mazari Sharif that indicated uh, that Mullah Fazl had a, had a plan, which was to coordinate the prison uprising with uh, the movement of forces to Mazari Sharif to try and recapture that city. And so Mark Mitchell's actions and the actions of the other Americans uh, there on November 25th and subsequent days stopped Mazari Sharif being recaptured uh, because it was it was a very clever plan that, 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 that could easily have worked um, if it hadn't been for the heroism shown by Americans and, and British in stopping this uprising. Well, it was a day of great sadness for the CIA family, but also a day of great heroism. It was the first, but as we all know, it certainly was not the last. Tell me, why was CIA so successful in the fall of 2001? And what happened afterwards? Well, I think, you know, it, the CIA played to its strengths. It did what it did best, which was uh, small numbers of officers, some with um, great military skills, uh, uh, also cultural and uh, linguistic skills, uh, working with the indigenous resistance and against the the foreign invaders at this point were the Arabs of Al-Qaeda. Uh, so there was no, actually no, I don't think it was a U.S. invasion really until, until 2002. Um, and the CIA clearly had experience in Afghanistan in the era of the Soviet occupation, working uh, principally out of Islamabad. And J.R. Siegel was one of those officers uh, supporting the Mujahideen. Ironically, Dostum was on the other side. He was he was fighting with the Soviets, but you know that's the way Afghanistan is. Um, but there was um, you know there was clearly a, a, an agency history there. And although uh, once the Russians uh, left uh, in um, in 1989, there was a um, you know the United States really was out of the Afghan business. But the CIA you know, specializes in staying. Uh, in places or in connection with places uh, that are not on the political agenda at any given time, because they might well be in the future. Um, and also through the 90s, when um, the Taliban uh, regime established itself and then uh, began to play host to uh, al-Qaeda and Os Osama bin Laden uh, was given safe haven uh, and was, was carrying out attacks against American targets around the world, the agency, particularly the Terrorism Center, and within that Alex station, the Al Qaeda units uh, within CTC were paying very, very uh, close attention. So, I mean, in that period of the 90s, you had the uh, bombings of two U.S. embassies in East Africa in 1998. You had the um, the bombing of the U.S. 
coal in October 2000. You had then you had a millennium plot um, uh, at the you know the turn of 1999-2000 uh, in the United States. And so CTC was warning that Al Qaeda is is coming here, and they were also uh, along with Near East Division sending in uh, small teams. David Tyson was uh, uh, on uh, the first one in, I believe, October 99, um, into the Panjshir Valley via Tajikistan uh, to link up with the, with the Northern Alliance, uh, particularly Ahmed Shah Massoud, who was assassinated on September the 9th of 2001. But the agency had a foothold. Uh, they had a plan, which was outlined in a document called the Blue Sky Memo, which was given to the to the Clinton administration uh, and then to the Bush administration, there wasn't the political will to uh, go into Afghanistan and uh, and do what happened after 9-11 and link up with them to get to Al-Qaeda. Uh, but once 9-11 happened, there was no Pentagon plan, uh, remarkably, uh, but there was a CIA plan. And so, you know, uh, George Tennant and Cover Black presented that, that to Bush. And it was limited. Uh, it was hundreds of Americans on the ground in this period. I mean, later on, there were um, uh, more than 100,000. And, you know, as I said, the role was a, as advisors. It wasn't an American war, an American fight. It was, it was Afghans. And the Americans were advising and assisting the Afghans, certainly, you know, working the tribes and the, the ethnic uh, dynamics, which were extremely uh, complicated. Um, but I think it was successful because it was limited. Um, unfortunately, I think what happened uh, sometimes, you know, you could be the victim of your own success. And I think there was a sense in Washington, D.C., in the Bush administration that, oh, well, this was, you know, easy. You know, we managed to topple the regime Um in just a few weeks, when the big predictions that it was going to take in, you know, beyond the winter and 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 you know, be a, a hard fought battle well into two thousand two, um, and there was also a sense of, with it, you know, with us or against us, uh, and so there was no uh, uh, appetite at all from Secretary Rumsfeld, uh, in particular, but I think you know others in the Bush, Bush administration. But involving any element of the Taliban, you know, even a defeated remnant uh, in a, a kind of uh, in the new Afghan government, as Hamid Karzai, who was the chosen uh, leader, you know, U.S. backed leader, wanted, and and it would have fitted in with Afghan tradition. So the Taliban were completely uh, excluded. Uh, there was also a sense, I think, that it was sort of prevalent in Near East Division. Uh, and uh, State Department that there needed to be a Pashtun leader, uh, even though the principal U.S. allies in the fall of 2001 had been you know, Tajiks and, and Uzbeks and Hazaras, uh, and that those groups together make up a majority of Afghanistan, even though Pashtuns are the, are the, are the largest ethnic group. And, I mean, this was the era of, um, you know, I think the French described it as the unipolar world, um, you can call it um, over optimism, arrogance, American can do spirit, but there was a sense that you know we could remake parts of the world um, and essentially build a nation in Afghanistan, a centralized uh, democracy. Um, and so rather than uh, sticking to those sort of very limited aims, uh, I think it became a very, very ambitious project. And I, I don't want to sit here in Northern Virginia 20 years later and say, oh, well, if only it was obvious what we should have done. I mean, there were no easy uh, answers in Afghanistan. And, and certainly, you know, uh, there would have been opposition to, you know, even small numbers of the Taliban being in that government, not just from the American public and American policymakers, but also people like uh, Dostum and, and the Tajiks. So I'm not, I don't want to suggest that any of this would have been easy. Um, but, uh, you know, to me, there was a very big change in how we dealt with Afghanistan right at the point of victory in December 2001. And then it became uh, an American occupation uh, with, you know, we became 
the invaders, if you like, um, stirred up Ashtun nationalism uh, and all those, you know, all those things. And, you know, this, this could be a, a discussion for sort of many, many hours, obviously, because you then get into what happened in the subsequent 20 years. Toby, were you able to gain access to members of Team Alpha? And if so, how did that work out? So, yes, I was. And uh, I mean, it's not something I expected um, or counted on. Um, and in fact, during my research, uh, the, the book became more focused on, on uh, Team Alpha. I'd initially seen it more as a book about sort of the blow by blow of the six days of the Battle of Kalajengi. But basically, I'd always been fascinated by what David Tyson had been through. He was captured on a video by German TV running across the northern uh, compound in the, uh, in the fort on, on November the 25th. And this, this footage of him basically bursting through the door into the headquarters building. And you can see his sort of staring eyes. You know, you talk about the thousand yard stare. He just been through, you know, he'd seen Mike Spann killed. He he killed many people himself. He didn't know whether he was going to live uh, for another few minutes, another few hours, or, or or what was going on. So I was always very interested in him, and I tracked him down eventually. And the way these things are, he was living in Vienna, Virginia, you know, just very close to me. We met at Panera Bread in 2013. Um, but, but David was still serving, and so... Uh, you know, couldn't talk anything more than fairly superficially. Um, but I always felt that he had a sort of desire to um, to tell his story and more importantly, tell the story of, of, of Team Alpha and Mike Spann. And so in 2020, right at the beginning of 2020, David retired. And, uh, you know, the, the communication had been pretty on and off. I wouldn't hear from him for a, for a year or two sometimes, but he said, you know, I'm out and, you know, let's meet up. And so I met with David. Um, uh, then I met with Justin Sapp, who's, uh, you know, on LinkedIn, serving colonel in uh, the U.S. mission to the U.N. And, uh, and then J.R. Seeger, who was the chief, uh, long, long since retired, um, writing some very good thrillers these days. Um, and so once I'd spoken to those three, I, I felt I had a pretty good um, handle on what had happened, but, you know, I wanted to get the, the full picture. And so at that point, uh, I contacted the agency with some trepidation um, because I had no connection. I had no in. I didn't know whether there was some other project. I didn't know whether uh, they viewed the whole thing as as, as still, you know, secret. Uh, but my pitch was, you know, it's 20 years, almost 20 years ago now. It's, it's history. Um, so there are very few security um, uh, sort of classification considerations. Uh, all but one member of Team Alpha was retired or dead. Mark Rassenberger sadly died on CIA duty uh, in the Philippines in 2016. So there were six still living. And to my surprise and, and pleasure, the agency was uh, was helpful. And they, um, yeah, they said to people like Scott, who wouldn't have spoken to me without the thumbs up from the agency, that that, you know, I was reputable and respectable and, you know, seemed to be a straight shooter. And so um, I met with Scott with an agency press officer present. Uh, and then uh, there was a, an interview with uh, Alex Hernandez uh, was, was put in contact with me. And I went uh, and spent, I think initially spent five hours with Alex at, at, in his home. And then um, the, the last person was Andy, still a serving CIA officer, and again arranged uh, by the agency, um, as well as other people like Brian, who's a um, very senior paramilitary officer, still serving. Amy, who was a classmate of Brian's, uh, Mike's, Shannon's uh, in uh, 1999 to 2000. So those interviews were arranged as well. And, you know, they didn't open the vaults to me. People were probably relieved to hear. I mean, there was no, you know, all my freedom of information requests were rejected. That's from a different different department. Uh, you know, it wasn't given secret cables or or anything like that. But um, I was uh, allowed access to the participants, obviously, with their agreement. There was no sort of compulsion to speak to me. And so, I mean, that was very rewarding 
you know, process of, of, you know, building up trust and, and credibility with these great Americans. Um, and, you know, it was an honor for me that, uh, I mean, it's also a huge responsibility. I remember Scott saying to me, you know, do it right. Um, and I certainly intended to, but I'm only human. And, uh, you know, I, I sort of had some sleepless nights or I'd wake up in the middle of the night sort of, you know, wondering whether I'd got something right or, you know, thinking I need to check that. Um, but, you know, they trusted me to tell the story uh, properly. Um, and I also interviewed uh, both Mike's parents, uh, Johnny Spann and Gail Spann in Winfield, Alabama, uh, and Shannon Spann, uh, Mike's widow, who was also a CIA officer. And clearly these, you know, intensely, you know, it's part of history, but also intensely uh, personal. Um, but I wanted to get the sort of, as well as the political context, also the, the human context, who Mike Spann was, who the other members of Team Alpha sort of were and are, and the effect, the ripple effects of of um, the loss of a of a life, you know, that, that that still endure today. So I mean, it was researching this and writing it was was quite a journey for me, um, and you know, I was extremely uh, gratified by. Uh, you know, the trust that developed between me and the members of Team Alpha. Uh, and I guess to a degree, the, the agency as an organization as well. Well, as I mentioned to you off camera, um, we are ultimately an extended family. And anything like this is intensely personal. During your fascinating journey, what did you learn about CIA? And were there any surprises for you? Yeah, I think I, I think there were... Lots of surprises. I mean, we, you know, we, as an outsider, you have um, the images of, you know, obviously a lot of this is from, you know, movies and, and fiction of sort of, of, of spies. Um, and also sort of almost in conflict with that, you have an image in Washington, D.C. of, you know, people talk about it as a huge bureaucracy um, where nothing ever gets done. And there are all these rules and procedures. So what surprised me, I guess, most of all, uh, was I guess the first thing would be the quality of the people and with the incredible resourcefulness uh, and variety within Team Alpha. These very different characters uh, with different skill sets that were complementary. And many of these guys didn't barely knew each other before they went in, but they worked together uh, very closely, not always seamlessly, but pretty close to it uh, in extremely stressful and uh, dangerous uh, you know, times. And then the second thing would be the extent to which um, this was improvised. And, and while there was a, a plan's almost too grand a word for it, there was a sort of a, a concept of operations. Um, and so the adaptability that these men showed on the ground and also, you know, the decision making that was delegated to them. I mean, J.R. Seeger was making decisions that were tactical in one sense, but they were strategic, certainly in their effect. And uh, Hank Crompton, he was talking to Hank Crompton, keeping him informed. But but I mean, I interviewed Hank Crompton and Kofi Black, and they let they left it to the to the team leaders and sometimes individual members of the teams because the team was uh, was was split up into twos and threes. So Mike Spann, for instance, led a three-man group um, south to Bamiyan to link up with um, Kareem Kalili, the Hazara leader, and be the pathfinders for CIA Team Delta and, and another ODA. It's so an incredible responsibility for a 32-year-old paramilitary officer who'd been in the agency uh, less than two and a half years. And so uh, I, I found the... Um, there's two things, the qualities of, of, of the people and the extent to which uh, uh, authority was delegated and, 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 and incredible feats of improvisation were carried out. Yeah, I certainly experienced that during my career that um, very often we gave um, amazing um, decision authority to fairly junior officers um, when they were at the, at the distant end. The book is called First Casualty by Toby Herndon. I think it's very appropriate 
that this book has come out on the 20th after, uh, anniversary of these events. Toby, I want to thank you very much. This has been a, a really fascinating presentation. Thank you so much, Jim. Uh, I'm really happy to to be on. I don't, do you call it a show or uh, but, or a podcast? But uh, it's very good to talk to you.